Hi there and welcome to this episode in which we will discuss Sunday night insomnia. I made four, four points that I really want to share with you. And before we jump into it, uh, I want to thank, um, let's see, I, I'm not actually sure how to pronounce this. So I'm going to take a look as we're speaking here. I want to ta- thank Lakimo Raka or Lakimo Rasha maybe, uh, for, because this, this is kind of what, what prompted this episode. Uh, two weeks ago, this is, an, uh, this is a comment on Talking Insomnia number 91, where we talked with Nick. And Lakima, uh, Lakimo Roca again, uh, said the following. Hi, Coach Daniel. Thanks for these videos. If you get a chance, wondering if you could do a video on Sunday night insomnia. I usually sleep well Friday and Saturdays, but Sunday night before work, I always end up getting just a few hours of sleep at best, which I feel triggers my insomnia throughout the week. And uh, when I saw that, I was like, yeah, I, I, I was kind of actually surprised. I was like, why haven't we talked about Sunday Night Insomnia before? And I was pondering this today. And I think, to be honest with you, I think it's somehow because I haven't found this kind of really, uh, really nice way to meet this or some, something really insightful to say about Sunday Night Insomnia. But, you know, that doesn't take away from the fact that it's very common and that I definitely have some thoughts to share. So, um, you know, maybe lowering the expectations a little bit here. Can always be helpful, but that said, this is why we're doing this. Let's 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 jump into it and see what we can do to meet Sunday night insomnia. So Sunday insomnia, you know, we don't need to define it really. It's it's when we struggle with sleep uh, on Sunday nights. And uh, I just want to say, actually, if 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 this is something that you've experienced as a kind of isolated thing for a while, then you know this video is for you. But if it's more like you had a lot of struggle with sleep and the sort of only thing that's left now is the Sunday night insomnia, then check out uh, Insomnia Insight number 421 where we talk about the final hurdle situation. So, okay, let's go to the first point. First point is, is actually just a question, like, do you have Sunday night insomnia? Is that really what's going on? Or is it maybe something a little different? And, uh, you know, I, I, I made a, like an A and B statement here, and you can see what fits you best. And A is stress about obligations keeps you awake longer on Sundays and B is stress about not sleeping keeps you awake longer Sundays and as you can see they're quite similar but not entirely identical and my point here is that if you said A that yeah it's just like I'm stressed about these obligations I have and therefore I'm up uh, uh, later on Sunday nights because you know Monday's coming up then I would say this is actually not insomnia this is just sort of the expected uh, wakefulness that comes with a heightened level of awareness or alertness or vigilance that we all have when there's something like important happening the next day, whether it is something we're excited about, like, you know, it's Christmas or whether it is like, oh, I have so much work to do uh, tomorrow. Totally expected. There's nothing strange or unusual about that or insomnia either, right? But but what I want to point out, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that if you'd ask like 100 people if they have some struggle with sleep before they go to work on Monday, if they have some trouble sleeping Sunday nights, I bet that like at least, you know, I don't know, 25, 30 of them would say, oh yeah, totally. And, and, and the, my point here is that a lot of people have some struggle with sleep or, or they, maybe not a struggle, actually, I, 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 I take that back. I shouldn't have said that. I, sh- I should have said a lot of people are awake or awake longer, are awake more, and it takes them a little bit uh, longer to fall asleep. They wake up more times Sunday night simply because of this obligation that they have Monday. And they don't think of it as anything strange or unusual. They, they, they just think, yeah, of course, of course I, I'm up a little bit more on Sunday nights because I'm stressed about Monday. And, you know, and, and, and my point is that if, if you identify yourself as, yeah, I'm like that, uh, actually, I, I probably have the same thing as so many other people then maybe there's nothing else needed to do. Like there is no actual insomnia. There's no fear of being awake here. So, uh, and, 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 you know, this can be so helpful because as always, when we're not, when we're not thinking that that anything strange or unusual is happening with us, when we think, yeah, this is so typical, this is what so many other people are going through. I guess I don't need to do anything about this. There's no pressure. There's no trying. There's no effort. And things get uh, a little bit easier just, just from that. Right. Well, that must be my first point. If you said a, there's no insomnia, only expected anticipatory wakefulness, and perhaps you want to just, uh, you know, tune off and say, that's it. I don't think I need to hear anymore. And, you know, that could have been, maybe, maybe that's a nice thing there. Now, if you said B, on the other hand, and then there is a component of insomnia, meaning if you said B, that means that you are afraid of being awake. There's a fear of being awake. Uh, and that, to me, to me, that's the definition of insomnia, when we're scared of being awake. 
And so, uh, by the way, either way, if you said it's more A or maybe more B, uh, what we're going to talk about next actually applies in, in both situations. But again, if you said A, then maybe you don't even need to listen, hear this part. But anyway, uh, two, point two here is, is, is kind of introspective. Okay, So why, if you said, particularly if you said, or I guess only if you said uh, B here, then the question becomes, OK, why are you afraid of being awake Sunday nights? And usually, this is not something that is very mysterious. There's some component of what I call secondary attachment, which is when not only do we have this primary attachment, which is just like, I'm not sleeping, and I, I want to sleep more. That's kind of the primary attachment. But there can be secondary attachment, which is like, I want to sleep more, because if I sleep more, then there will be some, some outcome attached to that. When I sleep more, and that leads to better performance, higher function, um, better skin, better appearance, better mood. It can be a whole bunch of things. But, but when it comes to this Sunday night insomnia, it's really often quite simple. This, the secondary attachment is related to function. Is basically, if I don't sleep tonight, then Monday, I won't do well at work or school. So, that's, so I just want to sort of clarify what Sunday night insomnia is about. All right, so now that we, we've seen this, then we get to perhaps the more interesting part for you, the, which is like, okay, how do I meet this? Okay, I see what it is. I understand that uh, in Sunday night insomnia is when I'm scared of being awake Sunday night because I think that if I don't sleep, then there will be some, some problematic outcome, okay? Or some not ideal outcome. So that, th that's it. And, and so how do we meet this? So I think, I think of it as like two ways. There's two ways to meet this, and this is A and B. And so let's look at A first, which I call detective work, which is basically questioning the idea. It's basically questioning the idea that if I sleep less than a certain amount, or if I have choppy sleep or something like that, then I won't function well at work. I won't do well in school. So, and how can we question that? It's not, it's not complicated at all. We, we just kind of go, go back through our memories, and we look specifically to find evidence that this isn't true. So the question can be like, can you find one piece of evidence that contradicts this idea? Maybe, maybe you can remember that one time where you actually did fine at work or in school after sleeping little. Maybe you can find that. Or maybe you can find another time where you were tired, you didn't function well after sleeping quite a lot. And here's the point. One single fingerprint can lead to kind of dismissal of the whole case, you know? If you just find that one outlier where, oh, I, I did fine after not sleeping, then it can lead to kind of, kind of deconstruction of the whole idea that you need a certain amount of sleep to function well at work or school. So that detective work can be really, really helpful. And sometimes I, I think, you know, just to, to make things lighter, I sometimes tell clients, like, you can put on, like, your detective hat, bring out your, like, magnifying glass, and look for clues. Like, look for every clue you can find to dismiss the case in front of the court, something like that. Anyways, uh, B here. So the B is sort of almost the opposite, which is like, instead of looking to challenge this idea, then go, go the opposite direction of being willing to, to experience the scary idea. And, and, and what I would say, like, oftentimes the idea becomes, the, the question becomes, okay, when should I do, when should, when should I choose A, when should I choose B? And I think that when we have ideas that are not super sticky, that they can be dismissed fairly easily, then A is quite nice. Uh, but when we have a really, really entrenched idea, a really, um, uh, you know, a, a deep seated, deep rooted idea, then oftentimes trying to dismiss the idea actually just makes it more sticky. Like when somebody has an idea, a friend has an idea, and the more you try to convince them of the, that that idea is not true, then they like become they, they become even more you know set in their ways, right? So again, I think this B is is more helpful when we have a really entrenched idea. We really truly believe that if I don't sleep uh, so well uh, Sunday nights, then I will not function well uh, at at, uh, at work or school. So B, I think, is really good in that situation. And what does it mean? Well, it basically means that we when we have these worry thoughts like maybe I won't do well at work tomorrow, then, then we just acknowledge that. And we, and we sort of say, maybe that's true. Maybe it is true. Maybe I, maybe I won't do so well tomorrow. And then when we do that, it's, it's, it's so relieving because then there's no resistance. There's no attempting to, 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 to fight the idea or to do something to achieve more sleep. We, we go like, yeah, it is Sunday night. I am stressed. I'm worried about tomorrow, and maybe I'll sleep less, and and and, I'm, I'm, and that's 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 okay with me. 
That's, that's, that's okay, I'm willing to accept that. Maybe we can even imagine the very scenario we're afraid of. Maybe we have this kind of like catastrophic thinking and we think that, okay, if I don't sleep, then I'm gonna be late at work. Somebody's gonna notice, they're gonna call me out. I'm gonna have this. And instead of saying, oh no, that won't happen and, and try to like it, contradict that, then we go, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna imagine that. I'm gonna imagine this scenario where I come late to work. I'm gonna imagine this person saying it. And then the, the nice thing here is that worry thoughts are sort of like warnings. They're sort of like warning signals from our brains, right? And when the warning is heard, then there's no real need to repeat it. So when you sort of imagine this thing that your brain is warning you about, not functioning well at work, not doing well in school, having a poor test performance, something like that, when you're just willing to uh, have that thought and, and see that thought through, so to speak, then there's no need for the warning. And that can be really, really helpful. And so uh, again, particularly when this idea is more sticky, I think that's super helpful. So uh, those are the two ways I think you can really meet it. But I have like a final comment that I think could be, could be important too, which is that when we are in the situation where we know that every Sunday night I have struggled with sleep, it can be very tempting to say, well, then I'm going to prepare for that. I'm going to do something differently on Sundays, on Sunday nights, so that I can sleep Sunday nights because I know this is going to happen, so I'm going to prepare for it. But the thing is, of course, we cannot control sleep. So when we have this idea that, okay, Sunday nights, I'm going to do this thing, it just makes us more preoccupied, more focused on sleep. You know, it makes us monitor how well our attempt and our experiment is working. And, and it just leads to more effort and more trying. So uh, as disappointing as it may sound, it can also be liberating to say, you, we cannot prepare or, or do something special. That just leads to more struggle. So when we do less, on the other hand, things become much easier. And there's much more about this anticipatory insomnia, which we often have before traveling in other events, not just Sundays, in episode 275 and 286. Um, and so my final words here is, is on this topic, which is that if we are sort of preparing less or none at all, and we, we deploy everything we learn in this episode, then there is less preoccupation, preoccupation less pressure, and, and more peaceful sleep. So I hope this made sense. Uh, uh, as always, let me know in the comment section what you thought, and if you have follow-up questions, questions, and we shall go from there. Bye for now.